Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of At Home with Mark. We are in season two. This is episode 13. This is lucky episode 13, Matthew. There's no bad luck involved in this show today. I don't believe in any of that stuff, so I'm, I'm ready to rock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so over Matt- breaking windows. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> we got Matthew Timmons from uh, Novo Guitars. Thanks for making the time, man. I super appreciate it. And I know we did this, scheduled this a while ago, and I, I love the fact that you made the time. No, I mean, it was a uh, out to me and i watched some of the other shows and saw who he'd had on and i was honored that you wanted me to come on at all it's great yeah man i mean the guitars themselves i've been watching uh kind of the growth for quite some time you know i guess because how long has novo been around i know because it was fano before right yeah so it's a little bit sort of the timeline with novo and fano is sort of like kind of confusing like dennis Dennis Fano for, I mean, good luck getting him on the show one day. He, if I had my, <laughs> I joke about it all the time, but if I had my own podcast, he wouldn't, he, it would be hard to get him on the show. Um, <laughs> but, but he sold, he sold Fano back in 2010 um, and then worked for Fano for about five years until he decided he wanted to break out and start Novo. Um, so Dennis was doing Novo by himself for about a year before I came on. So a lot of the DNA and all the sort of like groundwork was laid with the Fano stuff. And then with Novo, we kind of took it and ran with it. Uh, um, so yeah, if you're, if a lot of people are really into both. We still love all the old Fano stuff. I mean, a lot of the inspiration of what I want coming up next that we talk about, like, Hey, here's, you know, the Voltour that we just came out with was inspired by my love for the old Fano PX6 guitar. Um, that I always wanted a version of that for us over at Novo and he finally pulled it off. So, you know, the Fano stuff is still really great and they're still out there making guitars and I haven't t- checked one out in a long time, but I still have a soft spot for that stuff. So. Yeah, for sure. I think I actually talked to Dennis. I was at, uh, I went to the Berkeley college of music. I was there in like 2008 and nine. And I think I might've told mm-hmm. Dennis at one point cause I was looking at him. Um, but I mean, I always liked the aesthetic and like the, just how they're different. Like, and that's the thing about Nova that drew me in. And Matthew, your your video froze too. I don't know what's going on there, but I can still hear you, but I, I can't see you. Yeah, see you. Um, I can try to move around a bit here. But, um, do some do some calisthenics, see. get it rolling. Um, but yeah, I'll, I I'll just a gonna... walking tour of my house while I'm I'm trying to do this to see all the best <laughs> spots. You can always do that too. So you can always hit a bathroom up. Reverb's great in there. Um, whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I was just gonna say I like the fact. Mm-hmm. That they so are up a little. Oh, okay. I'll just wait. Is that but? Yep, I can see, see if I, it changed now. To see if I can. I'm trying to see if I can find a better spot here in the house. You know, I'm always like worried about like the the reception here. So let's go right here and see. All right, we'll we see doing. what happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was just gonna say I, I really like the aesthetic of the guitars because it's different, mm-hmm. and you know, being like a force fed growing up in the early 90s playing guitar like these mm-hmm. are your options you can get a les paul studio you can get a strad you can get a telly like when yeah. we were young growing up playing guitars we didn't have a ton of options you know like uh, we do now oh man i still remember when i was first checking out guitars and it was going through the musician's friend catalog and deciding are you gonna buy the, the epiphone les paul standard or the mexican strat yeah like that was it like in your my total path of my career has sort of gone the way it did because I chose the Mexican Strat with the maple neck. And I think that like, I wonder what I would be like if like you could travel back in time and I had chosen that Les Paul standard instead, like what would my life have been? Who Isn't knows? That, right. Dude. I know. It's so funny, <laughs> man. Like my first, what was your first like real guitar? Was that it? Like that, that was guitar? It. Okay. I remember I had a, my dad um, surprised me when I first got my guitar, I asked for it. So I, I tell the story a lot and we're, we're going to circle back to this, but Mm-hmm. I heard Pearl Jam when I was in sixth grade, and I from then mm-hmm. I just wanted to play guitar. Absolutely. So my dad got me this like three quarter size like Yamaha like guitar back in the day. This was probably like ninety one, no, or maybe ninety. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember the first guitar that I bought with my own money was a Les Paul Studio, and only until I realized when I played a Strat like who I was. Do you know what I mean? Like. You, you resonate with certain instruments and like the strat neck sure. and how it felt and everything was like totally me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I sold that and bought a clan. I sold the studio <laughs> in like 2000, 2001. And I bought a clan when it was 300 bucks. You know what I mean? Um, you still, ha- you still have that? I do not dude. I sold it uh. in 2015 for 1500 bucks. And I bought that, uh. sir. So that's, that's how I got that's... into sir. Mm-hmm. 
but um but sense. anyway but so my my first question all my guests on this usually is is back mm -hmm. at that like pearl jam moment for me like do you have a moment in your life that like music totally like kicked the door open and was like hey matthew this is what you're gonna do absolutely and it, it's a it's an odd one uh because it's probably not what anyone else would say but it's it's literally spinal tap itself right like not that i liked rock and roll but like literally i was listening to mc hammer and michael jackson and then i discovered spinal tap and that's really what what inspired me and it was really when they came back in 92 and they had the break like the wind album and i literally would listen to that album every day on the way to school because my dad was a huge like hard rock like he loved van halen and jeff beck and all this stuff but he really never pushed it on us it was like he kind of wanted us to discover it ourselves me and my brother and so we'd still listen to like pop music and all that stuff and then he would drive us to school every day and he'd play this spinal tap record and we just really got into it and it was literally it was like march of 92 so like pearl jam nirvana red hot chili peppers metallica was all coming up kind of cresting at that point and i got into it all right after that because of listening to spinal tap every day That's and so I, I and i really feel like it's like kind of really my my love of like you know the sort of absurdity of hard rock and heavy metal and not taking it seriously has been there the entire time because that's how i got into it is that it was always kind of like super fun like i was never i never took it super seriously in that way but i always loved every minute of it so you know it's it's uh it's the tap what can i say <laughs> you break like the wind so yeah. how old were you then like if you're listening i was, to that, you're I was 12 so i'm okay. 40 i'm 40 now oh yeah so, so we're pretty so close i'm 41. We're pretty close yeah so i remember seeing all that stuff in 91 when it came out like pearl jam and nirvana but i didn't get it yet like it just wasn't it didn't click until Spinal Tap, and then that summer, that's all I listened to was all that stuff, which is hilarious to me that everybody else hears, you know, Even Flow and Smells Like Teen Spirit, and I'm like, I just wasn't there, and then I had to hear Bitch School by Spinal <laughs> Tap, and then suddenly I was like, yes, this is it, I get it, yeah. I get it, which is the dumbest thing, you know what I mean? And then, you know, my dad getting really excited that we were going to get into this stuff, and him being like, cool, we're going to listen to King's X. And, oh. and right, like right away, he just threw us in the deep end. It was awesome. Like, dude, you're like, a rad dad. I do. I do. Do you know what, you know, the Zemitis guitars, you know, the metal no. top, check them out. My dad runs that company. So like, we're okay. like old, we're old school in the industry and he's a general manager. He runs that company, Zemitis guitars. You'll know him when you see him, recognize him, do a Google search, but yeah, he runs that company. And, and so, you know, we've kind of, it's been the family biz for a long, long time. And so, yeah, my dad's the, the coolest the coolest oh, of the coolest. Yeah. So did he play? So I'm gathering, did he play guitar? Absolutely. Like, okay. Like, I, I, he, you know, from ever since I was like little, little, like when I, I, we used to go out into the garage, like he had me and my brother when he was 21 and 22 years old. So like we were around when like Pops was like still like woodshedding, right? So I, I was in the garage with him when he was like learning how to play Panama and Hot for Teacher. Like I remember that. Which is funny to me that it wouldn't have clicked then that I should be a rock and roll guy. But, you know, right. you're, you're five years old. You don't really know. But, no, it's like he's he's an unbelievable guitar player. Like, that guy can rip. And oh, man. He was playing gigs Thursday and Saturday nights my whole life. You know, he'd have a Thursday night gig and a Saturday night gig. And it was like, oh, yeah, dad's going to play a gig. I thought everybody, their dads just went and played rock and roll on on nope. the weekends. <laughs> no, and so that's that's the way it always was for us. So incredible patience by my my loving father that he waited long enough and endured MC Hammer and all that stuff while he was waiting for us to get into rock and roll. And then we finally did. And oh, it was man. you know, first concert he ever took us to was the damn Yankees. Oh, Ted Nugent. Dude. And like it was great. It was awesome. It was 92. He's like, we're gonna go to a rock and roll show. We're gonna go to damn Yankees. It was awesome. <laughs> oh man. And meanwhile, my dad took my brother and sister and I to a, our first show and it was the monkeys. <laughs> I, you know, which is great. It still counts. It still yeah. counts. No, yeah. it counts. My parents it's weren't totally like, cool. my parents listened to music in the house and stuff, but like, you know, they, they just gave me a bunch of records in the past couple of years that they were just getting rid of records and they had mm -hmm. Sam Cooke and yeah. a lot of great stuff. Cause I'm, I'm into like R&B. I mean, I have a sound garden shirt on, but I love Sam Cooke and I love mm -hmm. R and B and soul music and stuff and D'Angelo and all that. But like that that Seattle thing, man, when that hit, I don't know what it was for me. I think the reason that 10 hit me and, and hearing Mike McCready is like it's it's similar in terms of like going backwards and finding out mm -hmm. who Mike McCready listened to and finding oh, out yeah. it, was, it was Jimmy and it was Stevie. And, you know, like mm -hmm. 
So there's all this like stuff that just comes full circle. Um, when you heard those records, like Nevermind and like mm-hmm. 10, like, cause I have this, you can tell me how you feel about it, but it's funny because when you listen to Nirvana and you listen to Pearl Jam, the thing that I find that resonates with me most about Pearl Jam is melody and mm-hmm. about like, not that Nirvana is not melodic because it totally is, but like there was a sort of sophistication that was involved with Pearl Jam and still is to this day, I, I mm-hmm. would say, and I, I would argue with anyone, even the last record they just put out, I love. But like, what was it about that music that hit you? Well, I think that it's like anything. I think it's not only is it speak to you because it's it's just it's just good and it's aggressive and loud and rock and roll. But it was it was ours. Like the mm-hmm. the difference between sort of the '80s and seeing like you know Def Leppard and Motley Crue and Guns and Roses and and then Poison and all that stuff, and then seeing like something that felt like oh, this is a movement and this is something that's different. And this is supposed to be for me. I mean, that's always very powerful. It was like, mm-hmm. so like, even though my dad was like a rock and roll guy, like we're going to listen to King's X and this is Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and Eric Johnson and Robert Cray. And, but he was like not into Pearl Jam or Nirvana at all, really. Cause it was just a little different. He didn't not like it, but it wasn't his thing. And so mm-hmm. I think there was just enough of that sort of like that feeling where it's like, have you seen this yet? Like the first kid that like had, Rage Against the Machine at school, oh. right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's just that energy was palpable, you know, and it's probably the first time in years that that had bubbled up that far into the mainstream where it felt like this, like, sort of underground punk rock, but then everybody's, like, getting into it. So there's that feeling right away when I sort of clicked for me, like, like that summer of 92, where it felt a little bit like, oh, this is for me, this is mine. Mm-hmm. And there was that energy to it that that was just, you know, really, it felt, you know, it felt it feels genuine. So it's like, it's like skip the generation. Like all those guys are, are like, you know, and then you find out all the other influences, like, oh, these guys really like Husker Du and the Minutemen and like all the punk rock stuff. And it's like, you know, it just felt very, you know, organic and genuine, like yeah. from, from the start, which was really fun, I think, to get into that and feel like that these guys were, you know, uh, not reluctant rock stars, but they did it on their own terms and everybody came to them. And I think you could feel that energy. Even yeah. at 12 years old, you kind of knew that that's what that was like. So oh, this is ours. This Dude, is ours. From like the music to fashion, even like, you know, I grew up on the East Coast and that stuff just spilled over the flannel, spilled over and covered oh, yeah. the country. You know what I Dude, mean? I, like, I, I remember going into my dad's closet and finding his flannel and taking it because I was like, <laughs> I, I like got to find something. It like hadn't quite hit J.C. Petty and Mervyn's yet. And I'm like, I need a flannel. I got to go to I got to go to junior high. This is like I got to I got to be ready. Yeah, so, man. like, I remember stealing, like, an old flannel that he probably, you know, never wore. It was just, like, a work shirt. And, like, I'm like, I got it. Now I look the part, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready. It's so true, man. I mean, that stuff was so, so inspiring. And it's it's really interesting that you say that, like, it was ours. Like, I feel very lucky, like, growing up in the generation we grew up in. Because of the tide that turned. It was a tsunami, man. It was, mm-hmm. like, you know, I feel like at that time we were coming off the hair metal stuff and it was, this was so different, but not so different at the same time. It was still edgy, like you said, and it was still hard rockish and, mm-hmm. and what, but it was, it was palpable that like, like you were saying, like it was a movement, you know? Yeah. And, and, and like I was saying too, it's like, it felt like very much like they, you know, and I think a lot of it was sort of the reaction that like, you know, Eddie Vedder and Kirk Cobain had, to fame and like there just wasn't you know they like it was reluctant it's like you know obviously there's a lot of trappings that comes to that but they didn't start these bands none of them thought they would be where they were at that moment they Mm -hmm. never even thought even close you don't sign with sub pop and play in you know in seattle like that and think that it's going to blow up like that so there's just something about knowing knowing that that was really special and made it very cool you know, uh, very early on sort of reading about them and their, their journey and their influences. And then finding out about like mother love bone and green river and mm-hmm. all that stuff really early on. Like, it was really cool to feel like, oh, I know about all this stuff. Like I bought bleach before anybody else, man. Me like too, I got man. it. Like I got in there. Like I know what's going on. Like that was a really exciting feeling yeah. too to be like, it didn't start at those records. Like we were so much to like find out about it. And then finding out like Soundgarden had, had, had like three records out already. You're like, what, what the hell? I know like that was super cool. Yeah, I know. Cause I mean, it's, it's hard to top bad motor finger, but then when you put out something like super unknown, which is like one of the most mind blowing, I've only recently in the past two years really gone back and listened to that record and like put headphones on. 
and it's listen so to it. Oh my gosh, dude. It's like the way it's recorded, mm-hmm. everything, the songs, like everything about that record. I don't want to say that's like Soundgarden swan song, but man, it's, it, it, it's hard to top that. I mean, I'm a huge fan of that record and, and dead on the upside too. I didn't really follow into the, like the later records after that too much. Cause I got into like Wayne Krantz and like jazz fusion and stuff, oh, <laughs> but, okay. like, yeah. but you know, it, it's like, it's weird because it's that music. And Chris Cornell, man, what a loss, dude. Like, that's, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, he was, he was the guy, man. He was the mm-hmm. goat. He was the goat. You know, he had like, you know, I mean, I'm, I don't know how much, how many, you know, I never really hear about it too much, but his solo record he did like 99, Euphoria Morning is so good. Oh, I it love is that album. So good. And like, it's crazy to me thinking about that, like how, like, a big of a deal that was at the time and thinking about like how different it was than what he had done. And like, you know, I really enjoyed it. And I wish kind of he went on that, like, I don't know how you feel about Audio Slave, but I kind of wish that he had gone, kept going that way. Because Audio Slave, I think, was was fine. I think it had some stuff that was all right. Some people might love it. And I just never super got into it. And I kind of wish that he had gone down that path a little bit, a little yeah. bit farther. But yeah, Super Unknown Man, that's that's the that's the record. That's like the mm-hmm. the opus out of all that stuff. Like I think that you can argue out of that whole sort of Seattle grunge era, like what the best records are, like, you know, but that one's like the epic. That's like the to me, I don't know if like what you want to throw around, like the physical graffiti or the dark side of the moon, but like super unknown, I feel like is that record of that era. Oh me. yeah. To me, just how, how experimental and big and sort of like, it was like a, a grand statement, so to speak. Oh yeah. I almost want to say it's kind of like the pet sound Sergeant Peppers kind of thing of the Seattle scene. Like everyone was like, Ooh. Ooh, Oh my God, we got to step our game up. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. A- after that. Cause that, that record, if you guys haven't listened to Super Unknown in a while, do yourself a favor, put some headphones on, listen to it because the mix alone mm-hmm. uh, it is just brilliant. And it's the songs on that record. I mean, from start to finish, man, like I don't think I ever really want to take my headphones off when I listen to that whole album. Well, I, the, I, li- I like that record a lot too because I kind of was like, that was when I was sort of getting into the idea of like, you know, deep dive more into like songwriting and understanding the band and, and realizing that all four guys wrote songs yeah. on the record and then how different those songs were that it worked, but you kind of knew, Oh, that's a Ben Shepard song. That's a, that Matt Cameron wrote Matt that Cameron, like, yeah. or, and, and, you know, kind of understanding the differences between the guys styles. And it was cool. It was really cool to get into that when I would start looking through the liner notes to see like the different publishing names. So you could see like who wrote what song and be like, Oh, I know that's a different, that's a different, different name there. Like who, who wrote this one? And like, getting Rick really into that. And there's not a lot of bands where all four guys can write songs mm-hmm. and have it and have it work. You know, sometimes it's like, eh, that so-and-so should be, <laughs> should be. <laughs> who They're let like, you put that on there? Who let, who let, hey guys, I got a great idea for a song, especially a drummer. You know, that's the old right. joke, but Matt Cameron, he, Matt Cameron writes stuff for Pearl Jam now and it's great. So it's like, yeah, but that was really cool. I think to see that, that like dynamic work where you got four guys. I mean, there's certain bands that like, Worked that way, like the Who was like that, and mm-hmm. like Mastodon. Now I'm a huge Mastodon fan, and they all four write songs and sing. And I think it's like I'm really drawn to bands like that. So what great uh, choice on shirts yeah. today? Excellent, <laughs> excellent, excellent choice. Yeah, totally. Um, so what was like the the music that you like cut your teeth to playing guitar? Like what was the stuff that you were winding the tape and and burning the tape out? So the funny part about it is, is that like I didn't really start playing guitar seriously until I was like 20. I I started getting into it when I was, when I first started listening to music, but it's, it's slightly a long winded story, but my brother is, was so good at guitar. I switched to bass and drums so I could play with him. Um, so like I, I, I was just, he just smoked me so badly early on. I was embarrassed. I was like, I want to play with him. Like he just like nailed it all like tool Pantera, like immediately he like knew how to play all that stuff. So I was like, well, let me get a bass. And I'll learn how to play. So when I started playing bass, I would learn like, like it was mostly like Rage Against the Machine, Alice in Chains, Pink Floyd, Soundgarden, like that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I actually decided to play guitar, finally, it was like 2000. And so I was really into stuff like the White Stripes. Like I was really like, I had gotten to that point where I was like, that was sort of the inspiring me was like listening to like ZZ Top and the White Stripes and a little bit more stripped down, a little bit more like like riff rock oriented kind of like bluesy shit like not like the blues but like playing it more in that that style was i was super into that and like radiohead i was really oh, into that at the time man. so trying to learn how that how to play that kind of stuff but i bought a strat 
when I decided, you know, we talked about that, that question very early on. I bought a strap because I went to see The Who and Pete Townsend was playing the Eric Clapton signature model at the time live. Oh. And I was super into it. So I decided to buy a strat because I was learning a lot of Who stuff at the time too, which he plays a lot of different guitars in the studio. Mm. Live, it's like an SG, like live at Leeds, like, you know, he plays Les Paul, but he was playing the strat at the time. So a lot of it was me sort of, it was, you know, mostly the white stripes was kind of like what I wanted to play. Hmm. Like the most, which is, you know, I listen to all that stuff. And also I'm a huge Metallica fan too, which oh, okay. is like, I'm like a huge, huge Metallica fan. So I learned a lot of that stuff too. Um, even on a Strat, if you have enough uh, boss metal zones, you can make it work. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh man, that's so great. Yeah. So what, so for the, um, let's go back to the who for a second, because yes, my best friend growing up is a huge Pete Townsend guy. He's oh. like, like my best friend from like fifth grade to now, you know, like he lives in upstate New York. Sadly, we're, we don't live close to each other anymore, but mm -hmm. he was always trying to get me into the who what's, what's the who record that you would tell someone if you're going to oh, enter what it, this is the one it's not even close. It's live at Leeds, man. Okay. That is so good. I think that live at Leeds record has the like maybe top five guitar tone of all time for me, like SG with a high watt. It's just so loud and so crunchy and so like it's crazy to me because it feels like depending on the song it feels like he might have used a ton of different guitars on there but it's so versatile the way it sounds with those p90s and just just turning his guitar down and, and playing all these different stuff but that record is so good because they do a ton of covers they basically do everything up until who's next right like is that record by the time they did live at leeds it was 1970 so you have mm -hmm. who's next and quadrophenia hadn't even come out yet so it's yeah. a lot of so it's a lot of Tommy and a lot of the early stuff and a lot of covers, but I just love the mix so much. Like the banter between uh, Pete Townsend and Keith Moon on there is hilarious. If you actually <laughs> listen to like the full deluxe version, there's all kinds of stuff. But Amazing Journey sparks like that mm -hmm. like section right there is like might be my favorite like guitar thing ever. And I just really love Pete Townsend because I really love rhythm guitar players that like mm -hmm. play to the drums, like where it's like. You've got John Entwistle basically playing like solo bass the whole time and Keith right. Moon's playing solo drums. And so Pete's got to keep everything in order with his his rhythm guitar and it's so good. And so I would definitely go live at Leeds. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's funny. I'm like, I've never really gotten deep in them. I appreciate the hell out of the who and I, I listen to them and they're mm -hmm. on my, they're on my phone. So if they come on, I don't turn it sure. off, but sure. I've never really kind of taken the time, but it's interesting to like, think about keith moon and like dude didn't really have hi-hats no. like <laughs> like it was just it's just splashy but his dynamics just, yeah. were amazing you it's, know like it's it's crazy to me to have that style like if you listen to it it sounds like four guys playing solos like it's weird and like just to, to know that like how did that even work at all like how do they even know where they're going when they're playing these songs like let's do a, a 25 minute version of uh you know magic school bus or something and you're like and you're like, how do you even know where you're going? But it's like, they just did. They yeah. just did. Did any of that stuff ever lead you into like checking out any jam band stuff like the dead or fish or anything? No, it didn't. It never did. That stuff never got to me. I think it works for me because there's still like just a very like, like top line element of like sort of like hard rock kind of in the who, like if you listen to it, one of the things I'm very like fascinated by is sort of like the origins of like styles of music, like, like listening to like, the first Zeppelin record and the first Sabbath record and saying like, they're like kind of the first guys to do that like style of riff. Like you're like communication breakdown for the first time. And you're like, mm -hmm. that was the first time everybody, anybody went. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Like, and then like Tony Iommi did it. And there's a part in live at Leeds where Ke Pete Townsend does it. And you're like, Oh shit. Like, <laughs> did he hear Jimmy Page do that like a year ago? Like it wasn't part of like one of the original songs. He just does it on one of the parts. And you're like, holy crap so there's just enough of that in the who that i think that's like sort of like in my dna is just like being very riff heavy and so yeah. like there's just enough of it there that really works it's a very underrated part of what they do but it didn't you know so i kind of like all that stuff and the jammy parts of it i like but it never it never led me anywhere else on there so right are you into that stuff did you go that way well yeah i grew up my brother my older brother and my older sister were huge into the dead so like this is a true story one night in my house my parents i think were interested i think they were doing a science experiment to see what we were all listening to mm -hmm. 
because they wanted to know what was being kind of shoved into our ears. And so we all, I brought down my little stereo and we all took a turn putting a CD in to, to play a song that we were currently like in love with. And their stuff was kind of more in that vein of the Grateful Dead. And, and I think I put on 4th of July. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's like the happiest song ever. And I think my parents were extremely like concerned for a second. Um, but, you know, it's it's interesting because I was always open to my, my uncle's a bluegrass musician. He exposed me to the Beatles when I was in the sixth grade or Ooh. something. And, and so it's just like. You know, I was always open to whatever music would be thrown at me. And if I resonated with something, I would dive down that rabbit hole and mm -hmm. check it out. And I think my brother is the one who kind of got me interested in, you know, the dead because of Jerry Garcia's tone and because mm -hmm. the idea, I like the idea of improvisation. I mean, that's why I went to music school. I wanted to learn more about how to do it like extensively so i could know my fretboard in and out and i wouldn't mm -hmm. be concerned if someone was like called a key and called some changes um but i you know it's they did segue into fish and stuff which segued into listening to mo and mm -hmm. umphreys mcgee and um all those bands but umphreys you might like umphreys have you listened to those guys no I haven't. they're like heavy like riff rock but they're a jam band but they mm -hmm. it's like heavy music um I'll send you. There's a song called "Wizard Burial Ground." Well, that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I know, right? I would never not listen to a song called that. Like, yeah. I'd be like, "Yes, I will try this out." Thank yeah. you. Yeah, but there, there's a. I'll send you some stuff because I think you might, out of all the jam band stuff, you might resonate with that better. Um, right on. In fact, the bass player Ryan Stasek is going to be on my show next month. Oh, awesome. Um, but yes, long story short, that's how I got into it. It's just because of my older siblings. I mean, is your sure. brother older? Like, is, is that how he's, you were? Well, he's, he's only 15 months older than me. So we were inseparable and like really, really close. So everything kind of happened at the same time for both of us, mm. but we will like get into stuff. Like he, like depending on who finds out about something first, like he gave me, he bought me Radiohead. Okay. Computer. Right. Mm. Like he's like, I think you'd really like this. And like, we'll have that crossover. And then he went more into like Primus tool, uh raised against like he went that way and then he was the first one he brought home like horn and deftones first and he's like this is some shit like, this is crazy <laughs> like let's get into this and so like we you know like you know you kind of you know go where you need to go so he went that side of things and then i went a little bit more like and then like different stuff like he really loved like dave matthews band and smashing pumpkins and i never got into either of them i kind of went like more tra traditional like you know hard rock stuff so okay. it's like and then i went like off the deep end when i started getting into like not off the deep end but i like i started going more punk rock and you know like like late 70s you know stuff and then and then i got heavily into judas priest for a long time like that i went that direction for quite a while too so it's like but we've always been like you know i think we send each other a youtube video of something musically like every single day it's something oh, like cool. that something like that and there's a thread between me and him and my dad where it's like let's watch some fishbone videos and stuff yeah. like that you know what i mean it's just like that's that's the way it is that's that's what we do so there's so much good music too man like like living color like that stuff oh yeah oh man like there's what's your favorite radiohead album I'd probably say, uh, so I have a theory on this. I have a theory on everything. So this is okay. sort of how it works for me. Bring it. Is that the theory is your favorite album is usually the, the next one that comes out after you get into a band. So if you get into a band, the next record is the, you're going to be your favorite of all time. Now, it's not 100%. I mean, you might get into a band and it's an old band. And so you have to listen to everything at once. But usually i think once you get into a band you're, you're so you're so hyped about the next record that i feel like that as long as it's good so kid a is my okay. favorite radiohead record because i remember the bands coming out and i didn't didn't register with me i remember creep obviously when that was a huge song but it didn't make me want to buy the record so my brother bought me you know okay computer and i'm like this is awesome and then when kid a came out i was like yes now this is something right here that absolutely stunned me because and never in a million years would I really listen to anything like that. Like I was mm -hmm. so traditional, like you got to have real drums and you got to play everything live and no click tracks and everybody's cutting it in the studio. Like I was a real like rock and roll guy. And then I heard that with so different and so many different textures and different styles of, of yeah. instruments. And I was like, it blew me away. I loved every second of it. So that's still my favorite record of theirs by far. It's a good one, man. The first seconds of everything in its right place.
Oh yeah. Like, first couple notes. I'm just like, Oh my God, that Rhodes, what is this? Like, it, you know, Oh, that record's yeah. so good, man. And then they play, they did Saturday night live, like right after that came out and they played national anthem and it just was mm. like bass and horns. And you're just like, they don't give a shit. Sorry, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know about cussing. I do it a little much, if no, I get into I'm it. Sorry. but it's like, that was like, I was like, they're just trying stuff. And I just really liked it, you know? Yeah. So, but, but I don't know, like do that theory, like think about it for yourself and like, go like, it was my favorite record from the band. The one that after I got into the band, the next one that came out, it like, happens yeah. like, for me more than more often than not. That's my favorite record. Uh, it's bands. funny. I'd have or, to really think about that. Cause like, I think for their records, like my top, two would be hail to the thief and um in rainbows probably oh both excellent albums yeah absolutely because hail to the thief there's just something there's something so dark about that album they were in a place man oh, that was really man. that was really good i liked it a lot too because you kind of they were kind of going in a direction with kid a and amnesiac and then they still had some of that stuff but there was so much like of okay computer on that record like it was still they kind of brought back a little bit of like the epicness of that and a lot of the guitar and drums that they kind of didn't have the two records before so it was really exciting to kind yeah. of to kind of have them come back and do a record like that so yeah i, I love that one dude I, I saw them at the tibetan freedom concert in washington dc dude that that list of bands that roster was out of control the beastie boys were on there red hot chili peppers pearl jam dave matthews band radiohead and I remember Radiohead came on right when it was getting dark and I was there with my girlfriend at the time. And I was like, holy crap, I think and I hadn't heard any of their music at that time. And I was like, I think this band is the next Pink Floyd, like mm -hmm. hands down. Like and it's weird to say that now because obviously they're, they're doing something that's totally unique. Mm -hmm. But like that's the show that they put on and everything was mm -hmm. so amazing. But I just feel like that. I mean, who opens like in Rainbows? The first tracks in five, four. They definitely don't care. They're like, we're no. going to throw something super weird at you. And it feels good, too. It doesn't yeah, feel like totally. it's in five. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, that band. It's, it's just that, like a they're on another level, man. Still, I've never seen them live. That's the that, they're really? kind of my white whale a little bit. Like, for whatever reason, it just never happened. And so I really, I really want to see them live. Oh, it just had never have for whatever you. reason. Oh, man, you we'll, got do you. It. we'll do it eventually. I'll get yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, it's so good. Um. What was your first guitar rig? Like amp, guitar, and if you had any pedals. Oh my god. So this is gonna be great. This is like a good <laughs> this is a laugher. This is a laugher. So the first guitar was the it was a midnight blue Mexican strat plugged into a line six flex tone two. Okay. Like that now that was a rig. Now I don't know if you were into like line six and the pod stuff when it came out. No, but I like, wasn't. Oh good. Good for you. Congratulations. <laughs> but we were like, the, so like I got one of these, these Flexstone 2s and it was just a modeling amp with a speaker. So it was like an amp and they made it look all vintagey. So it was basically like the pod, which was like the first big like modeling amp, you know, headphone kit thing that you can do. And so I was like, oh, I'll get this thing. And then I, and like at the time, like Guitar World would in their transcriptions would tell you what settings to put on the pod. So you get the sounds. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, this is it, man. This is what I'm going to get. And Man, that sounded like trash. It was bad. It was just like, there's a lot of Line 6 spider memes, but people forget about the Flex Tone 2 and how trash that thing was. So that was my first rig, like just playing in headphones in the house, like trying to like learn how to play Alice in Chains and White Stripes and stuff like that. And, it, you know, it, 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 it did the job because I, I was rocking out and having a good time, but there was no tonage. There was no, <laughs> there was no, there was no, like, I, there was no, there's no tonage going on at all. It was just... It was just straight, it was just straight, you know, survival at that point. So yeah. my, 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 my rig journey was, was quite a, it's, it was a long journey to get where I am now when it comes to that stuff. I had a lot of fits and stops. It was bad. It well, was let's bad. fast forward. Cause you just got a new guitar. I did. I did. So I let's talk about your guitar. current rig. Yes. Yes. So I just got, um, one of our new Voltors, our new model. Um, that we we debuted in December. It's a Olympic white with a maple neck, so it's the first little tour with a maple neck. And I've been been wanting one of these things forever. I mean, you know, I love that Firebird style body shape. It's just real aggressive and mean looking. And I wanted something that had just like really cool vibes. I've got a Harmony Burst uh, Saris, and I've got 
a TV Brasolis, I wanted white so it would kind of stand out next to it. And I always think Olympic white just looks really cool. Oh, yeah. um, so I wanted something that would be aggressive. Like that that bridge pickup is a, is a Fraylin unbucker. So it's higher output and it splits really nicely. So it's it just sort of like the first time I played the prototype, I was busting out all the Metallica riffs. For the first time in forever, because they don't really, the guitars we make now don't really scream Metallica. But the, the prototype was... A Dennis called it a faded uh, roundup orange, so it looked very like amber. So it kind of reminded me on the prototype, like a Carina Explorer. Oh That's yeah, that's what kind of felt like. So when I was playing it, I kind of just was like, it felt like playing Metallica riffs and just really busting it out. So I've got um, at work, I've got a a fifty watt Randall. Uh, it's an RM fifty. It's it's one of these amps they came out with like fifteen years ago that has like ex like uh, exchangeable preamps. So ah. you could so you could do blackface Fender, you could do exotic, I mean uh, XTC Bogner, you could do all these things, and it's a it's a EL34 tube amp, and so I've got um, a Doctor Z Maz18, and then a Fender blackface, and I just run it through every overdrive pedal in the world, Man. and just crank it, and then at home I've got I just got a Benson Nathan Junior for the house, so that's oh, my yeah. that's super super cool. I love Chris's stuff, and I wanted a nice amp. I've got a six month old daughter. And so it was like, I need, I was using like an Iridium Strymon just for a headphone rig at home while I was playing. And I wanted something, I mean, five Watts is still freaking loud when you've oh, got yeah. a, a, a six month old daughter. She's still, so we got her a little pair of like baby headphones so I could, yeah. so we could put her on her so I could, I could play a little bit, but five Watts is better. Cause you know, I can kind of crank it up a little bit and it's not too crazy. So yeah, um, it's cool. You know, I'm, I'm really like, I'm kind of adrift a little bit as far as what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm not like playing in a band right now or doing any recordings it's just like well, what what sounds fun yeah you know what i mean so which is dangerous because you end up buying lots of stuff when you're just you have no you have no directions you're like well that pedal <clears throat> sounds cool i have no reason not to get it so i'm just gonna go ahead and <laughs> get it dude so, that's been quarantine i mean like I, for oh, you yeah. guys i mean you guys have survived wonderfully through covid it's been great actually and, you, you know, know people have been at home and the people that have been at home still had money to buy guitars thank goodness i mean it's been business has been better than ever so it's, yeah it's great we're very happy so yeah it's crazy well let's talk about the guitars because yes right before we came on air guys i was i was putting this out there that i'm thinking about buying a novo because i'm about to sell a guitar and I've been a Strat Tele guy, and I have three Strats and one Tele. I'm like, I don't need another Strat. I need something different mm -hmm. that I can play slide with. That's a beautiful instrument that mm -hmm. will be a pro level thing that I can take out and work with. Yep. Um. So let's talk about for people that don't know the different models. Sure. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about that because we would start with the one that I was looking at. So I was looking at the Solus. Yes. Um. Start there, and we'll go through them. Yeah. So the Solus is a is a single cut guitar. Um. It's a 25, sorry, 24 and three quarter scale, you know, single cut guitar. So a classic sort of setup, but we do it in tempered pine and uh, maple neck with a rosewood board. So it's kind of a nice classic Dennis Fano design where you've got some hybrid action, right? It's a single cut. It's got, uh, you know, that shorter scale length. It's got a nice beefy, you know, neck. It's the wider nut, um, but it's like kind of, it's a bolt on with, uh, you know, pine and maple. So you really get to cover so much ground sonically because you get that sort of stoutness of like in the one we're talking about, we do we do three different versions of the guitar. We do the Solus F1, which is a Tele bridge and a Tele uh, bridge pickup and no neck pickup. So like kind of Esquire-ish. And mm -hmm. then we do the M1, which is a dog ear P90 and that's it. No neck pickup. And those are designed to be as simple as possible. So it's a single cut, single pickup kind of design. And Solus means single. So, you know, real Real, uh, you know, groundbreaking, really groundbreaking. <laughs> and then, the, then the Solus H2, we decided to do something that was a little closer to the single cut ideal, which is two humbucker with a tunematic, but still a little bit of that twist because since it's a pine body, we wanted double black bob and humbuckers to kind of give it a very a little more rock and roll raw feel to it. So it's like a little bit more, you know, late seventies kind of feel to it with those double black bob. And so it's it's a very simple idea for a guitar. But they're so effective because it just it's just covers so much ground. I mean, I have an F1 myself, and I absolutely love it. I love Tele Bridge pickups; they're Me super too. awesome, and it's just such a comfortable guitar. That scale length and the neck feels so good. The body is 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 smaller than uh, our our Saris line, but it's got a nice stoutness to it. And you know those those it's, we use the modern PAF Freylands, 
on there and they're awesome because they've got great output. They've got classic PAF tones, but you know, w- with that pine and that maple, it's going to be brighter than a traditional double humbucker guitar. Mm-hmm. So we wanted something that kind of leaned into that without getting ice picky. So it's very just cuts. It's just a, a sharp guitar, which is super rad. Are those Freelands, are they like middle kind of output, not low output, not high, but kind of sitting in the Yeah, middle? they're in like the, yeah, I'd say they're in the eights, I think. So it's not, I don't know what high output's considered, like nine, 10 kind of thing. And we're not talking about like a, like a 14 DiMarzio kind of thing going on. So it's right. like, but they're good. They're, they've got nice output to them and they're, they're real, uh, they're real thick sounding. Um, Dennis uh, and I both love really bright pickups. Um, partly because we feel the philosophy is that you're going to, you're going to have a hard time cleaning up anything that's muddy, right? Mm-hmm. You can put treble boosters on, you can crank the treble on the amp, but if you have like a nice cutting, like bright tone, you can always round that off pretty easily with the guitar, the tone knob or with the pedal or with an amp. But like you want something that's going to cut through the mix and really stand out. And it's never shrill or ice picky. It's a fine line, but we feel like that, you know, with the choices that we've made, it's done that. And we think that's why we like it a lot. It's just, you know, it just sort of really has a lot of presence and resonance. So. That probably would be great for me considering the tuning that I play in. And I usually generally like a darker kind of rounded edge on my tone. Mm-hmm. So I, I usually keep it. It's not super dark, but like it's it's got that snarl. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, without be, being too bitey um, in a way. But I think that would probably be good for me to kind of play through something like that through my rig because it, it, it's more malleable. Um, yeah, and that's song why, song, and that's know? why we like it a lot. I think it's it's sort of like it's it's going to cover a lot of ground, um, you know, where you know, like a traditional like mahogany set neck guitar, which has a wonderful tone, and there's so much you can do with it. But we feel like that there's there we like something that's got you know, it's a little bit more into that bolt on camp where you've got a little bit more of that that sound to it. So mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. And then uh, go into the next, just click the next uh, model. So we yeah. So the Saris model, that's the one that started it all. That's sort of like a hybrid, sort of has like the classic Jazzmaster offset look to it, um, which is interesting because when you put it on a Saris J, which is our most popular model, which is two P90s and a Mastery Bridge and Trim, which is the Jazzmaster style trim, it very much evokes that classic look of a, you know, traditional like Fender offset. But even that, but you can put any, any bridge in any, you know, humbucker or P90 or single coils and the body shape kind of takes it all. And so we've done a lot of different versions of it. So the Saris J is two P90s and a, and a master bridge and trim. And then we also do the TC, which is two humbuckers and a chop telly bridge. So mm-hmm. it's a little bit like sort of what we were getting at with the H2 and the Solus, but it's got that chop telly bridge. So you get a little bit more bite there. So it's a very, you know, versatile guitar. Um, then we do the Saris T, which is Tele bridge pickup and then a P45, not a P90, a P45 in the neck, which is a custom P90 with one magnet. So it's a little bit brighter than oh. a standard P90. So you get a little bit, we don't like no mud, no Novo guitars. It's like a no mud policy for anything that we do. So those are the three Saris models. So they're pretty different, same body shape, but you know, different pick guards, different setup like that. Um, mm-hmm. It's a little bit bigger of a body. Um, which I really like. So it's like, uh, just has like a nice stoutness to it. And that's pretty much what people are going to notice first. Like that's, that was like for the first couple of years, that was the only body shape we had. So right. that's the classic. And then we have the Miris, mm-hmm. which is the same body shape as the Saris, but it's semi hollow. So we hollow it out and we've got a, you know, a center block in the, in the, in the middle. And we do that in a Miris J. So it's two P nineties and a mastery and then a Miris T so we kind of mirrors those Saris versions. It's like a semi-hollow version of those two guitars. But then we also have the this the Miris H2 and the Miris P2, which is H2 is two humbuckers and a tunematic, and then the P2 is two P90s and a tunematic. Mm-hmm. So we're venturing a little bit into like 330, 335 territory with okay. those guitars. So that's kind of what we're going for. So think about the Miris as sort of a hybrid between like a 335 and like a Tele thin line. Okay. Like it's like it sort of like lives in both camps. So it's a very versatile, very cool, very different guitar. Yeah. So, what's the those weight are, on those? Like what's the weight on the Solus and then the Saris and So all of our guitars we're shooting for a sub seven and a half pounds. Every oh, guitar. Wow. Every single guitar. Because there's pine for the most part is pretty light. I mean, you can get some heavy pine, but we uh source it and we're very uh, hardcore. I'm not I'm very hardcore with my supplier about what we're looking for. Mm-hmm. So we try to do 
sub seven and a half on everything. We do not want a guitar that's over eight pounds as long as it's pine. Like we'll do some stuff that's like a one off that might be a little heavier if Dennis likes the wood, but all, all of our stuff, like my Solus is 5.8 pounds. What? Which is stupid. It's absolutely insane. It's is like the balanced. It, okay. Like it's, it's like balanced. It's great. Oh yeah. It oh, feels wow. great. But it's insane how balanced that is that considering, but it's like a feather. It's, it's insane. That's how, how light. light. That That's... It's a little bit close to being too light. It's like, it's just barely on the edge of like, then I have like a toy. Like if you get too light, it's like a little bit weird, but we're really hardcore about that. We're not in like heavier guitars equals heavier tone camp. Like we're lightweight, very comfortable ergonomically. Like it's balanced when you're sitting, it's balanced when you're standing, there's no neck dive. Like, Dennis and I are like hardcore about all that stuff. So, because yeah. we can be, it's our own designs, it's our own guitars. So, like, we don't have to adhere to anything. So, we can kind of make it like a good example of it is the Voltor, which is the last model, which is like a Firebird style body shape, but it's a completely unique take on it. It's like, you know, where the neck sits. And, and some people that have played style, those style guitars, it's like kind of funky exactly where all that is and then sitting down with the Voltour for the first time you're like wow this is like perfect like it just feels like exactly right and you're just going to want to shred faces yeah <laughs> so <laughs> all my I buddies do. who have your guitars are all they've all i mean i talked to rj today mm -hmm. <clears throat> about it and he was like dude if you get one you're gonna love it trust me it's like it feels like a second skin kind of thing and that's mm -hmm. how I, that's how i felt when i played a, a surf for the first time i felt like somebody had measured my hand Mm -hmm. And like while I was sleeping and like put this neck in my hand and it looks like your necks are like that. First of all, they look freaking gorgeous. Like Thank the you. roasted, you know, maple that you guys are using, whatever it is. It's like, yep. oh, they look gorgeous. I mean, that's let's be real. Part of the appeal of guitars is it's got to look sexy, too. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. maybe... <laughs> I mean, I, I when I worked at a guitar store, like I leaned into that. Like the first thing I always did when somebody came in to like check out a guitar Especially like a beginner, I said, all right, let's go to the mirror. And then they'd stand there. I'm like, how cool do you look right now? Like, how cool <laughs> do you feel? Like, why wouldn't that be the first thing that you want to care about? Who cares as long as the guitar can, you just got to feel awesome. Like, yeah. and so we, of course, that's a huge, huge, huge part of it. Um, and I love the, the, the roasted maple. I think I was never really into maple neck guitars, that, that sort of bright white kind of like contrast there. And then when we started doing ours and seeing how like grimy the fretboard gets and how dark it looks, I was like, this is cool. Like I really, really dig that vibe because I feel like it's it's versatile because you can do a maple neck on a lot of colors that maybe you would never do a maple neck on right. because that contrast isn't as extreme and so it looks really cool. So we've done a lot of maple necks on colors you never it was no one's ever done or no one's it's not something that you would see. It's not just a traditional fender color with a maple neck and it looks looks awesome highly recommend it yeah um, to go that style just because it's just got a lot of pop to it yeah they're, they're great looking man i mean i the whole like roasted maple neck i've i've been wanting to get something like that for quite some time mm -hmm. like flamey and just like gorgeous on the back it, i was gonna ask you so for the solace how's the heel joint as far as playing up higher in the higher register it's good we, we do a con uh you know a contour joint right there so it's rounded off so on the Saris and the and the mirrors it's like a traditional squared off fender joint but on mm -hmm. the solace because of the of the single cut and the roundedness of it like we did a joint there so you should be able to to get up there to all them tiny strings if that's what you're into <laughs> You know? I don't get up there a lot, but I'll, I will get up to G and A like sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, and like just yeah. for, to build things up. But uh, man, they're they're just so great. So Drew, my buddy Drew's in here. He was asking about um, are you going to do a single PAF Solus? Oh, Drew, I Drew, man, he just got a, a Harmony Burst there J this week. Uh, yeah, 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 awesome. Yeah. You know what? It's like so the, the so the the signature series, which is what a lot of people are talking about right now. Those are these one-off guitars that Dennis is making, and they could be anything. He could decide to make uh, a double neck flying V tomorrow, and we would, we would. I don't know how that works, but but we could do something like that. So he decided he wanted to do a Solus with a single humbucker in the bridge, which is not a current offering, and it's been very popular. People are really into it. So I would, I would not be surprised if we decide to add that as a regular guitar down the road. Part of what Signature is is trying those things out. Sort of mm -hmm. like you get to show off a little bit of your, your, your sort of prototyping 
and see mm -hmm. what sticks and goes like, Oh, do, do people want something like this from us? And you're trying to make those kind of decisions where you're like, you know, do what's, what's worth making and what's not. Cause there's, it's unlimited what we can do. Um, right. So every week on Thursday, we release a guitar that's, that's spec out and almost entirely built by Dennis himself. And it's, it's absurdly cheap comparatively to what that should actually be. But I want it to be like out there and, I want people to really get to enjoy them and they sell out in about five seconds. Like it's literally, you have to be logged in and ready to go. If you want to get one of these guitars, mm -hmm. um, cause they're very special, but he's got, he's made two H ones so far and he's got another one coming. So he likes it enough to where I think it's going to happen. So good question, Drew. That's cool, man. Yeah. I saw him post something on Facebook where he was like, well, that didn't last long. Like he posted the, <laughs> the last guitar and it was like, boom, it was gone already. Yeah. Well, that's like now all week I get bugged by people saying like, let me see it. Like, what is it? Let me see what it is. And so <laughs> Dennis is starting to like tease it out a little bit more on his Instagram feed. So if you follow him, you might see what's coming. Yeah. Um, which it's really exciting, but it's like also really stressful because you're like, I want everyone to get a guitar. Like, Mm -hmm. getting one now is like hard like we're back ordered a year and you know we've, we're trying to figure out right now like how to expand the company and how to make more guitars with the uh, quality staying the same it's not an easy it's just hire more people and buy more machines and then voila you're gonna you're gonna doing it so it's it's a uh, it's kind of stressful right now because i want everyone to be able to like i right, if you can hear this and you know, they're hearing about nova for the first time and they're like want to check it out well we're all direct so they can't go to a store and they're right. like, well, I can only buy one. It's like, well, there's nothing to buy. Yeah. So it's like, hey, you know, like I'm glad I'm out here promoting my brand. Buy it. We got hat. We got hats for sale. You can buy a hat. You can buy a hat and a shirt on the website. So we're we'll, we'll get there. A nice mug. You can get a nice yeah. mug. Yeah. You can so. buy a guitar. You just gotta wait. And then you know, everybody that I've talked to though have been like, dude, I, it was worth the wait. You know. Well, we so. we we hope so because it's a it's a really important thing to nail. Like you only have. You're only as good as the guitars that are out there, right? If everybody's like, you know, saying like, oh, you know, they're they're all right. You know, they were cool and I waited and it was a cool guitar. But if you don't nail it, you know, people are going to find out about that pretty quickly. You know, you can sell a lot of guitars to dealers and there's a nice backlog there. But if you're doing direct straight to people and you start to fall off, it's like, you'll we'll hear about it right away. So yeah. I need everyone. Every guitar has got to be the best guitar. That's yeah. how it works. That's killer, yeah. man. That's great, though. The The QC there is is off the chain from what i can see well, it's it's a big part of what we do it's like it's uh i mean i know everybody probably qc's their guitars but we call it officially a, we have a no dud policy that's what it's called and so it's just making sure that everybody's like jazzed about every guitar i want no matter what guitar it is like i want it to be someone's favorite guitar of all time yeah. like it's a god like that's the level we're going for not like it's another good novo out there but somebody's like this is the best guitar i've ever played that's yeah. what i want it's yeah. a lofty goal. What can I say? It's like, why not? Why not go for that? I mean, but yeah, shouldn't you be that way though? I mean, it, it's like, uh, you know, being a songwriter or doing anything like you don't want to put out crap. Like you don't want to put out stuff. That's not going to be your best foot forward, you know? Well, But that's the hard part about like, you know, what kind of compromise do you make as you grow? Like, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. what I mean by that a little bit is like, you know, what I don't want to do is say like, okay, we're going to come out with a new line and it's going to have like, pickups that aren't as nice or bridges that aren't as nice or maybe we'll use cheaper this and that i'm like i just i, I want to make it affordable we have a an import line revolta and they're mm -hmm. completely different guitars for a reason because we want it to be distinct what a novo is and what a revolta is and so i just I, I it's it's a it's like what we talk about every day which is like how do we make more stuff and where are we going to go and can we do what we're doing now and scale it and have it actually work Right. right. How, they have, can they look this way? Can we get the wood? Can we do all that? And, you know, to your you know point earlier, you know, you have a Sir or there's PRS. There's companies that are big and they make great guitars and they consistently make great guitars. So I know it's possible. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, it's just deciding, you know, when and when how we how we kind of go about that and right. go for it. You know, that's exciting, too, though. You know, it's it's like it is. It's a really I know it's you're probably stressed and it's like you got you're taking on a lot of that stuff and trying to figure it out and the best way you guys can. But what I appreciate, you know, just from what I, I mean, getting to know you now, you know, and I knew you seem like a lovely person before I met you today, but like, I feel like there's some companies that I really like supporting. Like I'm a, I've only used string joy strings for the past five or six years. Another Nashville based company. Well, so. we can, I'll, I'll break some news on the show. You want to break some news? 
Oh, uh, bring some. We switched to String Joy exclusively as of today. Really? We Yay. did. We, I don't think we'd actually said anything to anybody yet, but we we got our shipment in last night, so we switched over oh. to String Joy. I've been talking to Scott for a while, and our paths have crossed here and there, and it was just sort of like it kind of came together finally where we're like, we want to use them, and we've made a lot of sense. I mean, they're they're literally like down the road from us, you know? Yeah. So. We decided it was time, so we use String Joy exclusively now. Oh man, that makes me so happy, dude! That's yeah. so great. Yeah, they're they're strings. I I can't I can't scream like at the top of a mountain loud enough about how much I love their stuff. Like the first time I slapped some on my guitar and just played it not plugged in, I was like, "Whoa!" Like it was like just super. Like, it made the guitar be more resonant, and like, mm -hmm. like everything, every little nuance of every string was so articulate. So I was like, I'm never, I mean, there's no reason for me to play anything else. And I stuff. was touring yeah. for touring for a long time using elixirs on my electrics because I didn't have a ton of money and I was trying to make them last and Lasses. last because mm -hmm. we were playing three or four nights a week in a van cruising. And these, I feel like would do the same job as those, you mm -hmm. know, back then they're just amazing. Like those strings are so fantastic. Um, one more question and then we'll do our lightning round. Um, Novo bass. Okay. Ooh, is this the Devon? I think it is. Okay. You know, it's uh, it probably is. So we are currently, you know, finally. I mean, we've been teasing this thing for a long, long time. And the problem with the bass is, is that Dennis is a bass player, and mm. so he wants. He's very, very, very particular about this, and so a lot of what we're doing is custom, custom parts. So it's mm. just taken a long time to do R and D and get everything ready, but. The I've seen the wood has been ordered. It is in the shop. It should be getting processed soon. I think by summer we'll finally have bases. So oh I, I know God. it's been it's been a thing everyone's been waiting a long time for. And it's like we just we've had we have a prototype that's on the front page of the website. You can see it. Um, I kind of snuck it on there on the front page and didn't say anything <laughs> about it. Some people see it and they're like, "It's a double base." Oh my God! <laughs> but <clears throat> excuse me. So, <clears throat> but we. Uh, we kind of took our time to get it right. And there was just a lot to do uh, to get there. And again, since like Dennis is so particular about it, he's a great guitar player, but bass is the thing, you know, I've got, there's a picture of him in his office of when he was 15 years old playing his bass, you know what I mean? And that's, he's always been a bass player first. So this is, you know, very important to him to get right. And we have like a, a, a an army of bass players that work for us too. Like it's like mm -hmm. a high percentage of the team is bass players. So Whoa. this is a big deal for us to get right. So it's like, it's going to be, it's going to be nice. You know, we're excited. Man, that's yeah. super dope. So that's it's coming, awesome. coming soon. I, I, I promise everyone it's coming soon. So TBD. Um, all right, cool. So Matthew, at the end of the show, okay. I do this silly thing. It's called the lightning round get down where I ask 10 questions. Mm -hmm. It's a, this or that type of thing. Like a, would you rather, and we're going to go at a cruising altitude of one Oh five BPM to build okay. up a little suspense. I'm freaking out already. Oh my god! Oh my god. <laughs> right, can, I, can I can I pass? Can I pass? You you or can't pass. Okay, you can't pass. You, you have to ask. If you need to grab a bucket, a throw a bucket. Feel free to grab a bucket. Um, okay. You can explain your answers if you want, but you don't have to. You can just cruise through them. Okay. Either way, I love hearing a good explanation. Okay. The first question is always the same. Yes. Lennon or McCartney? Uh, McCartney. Maple or mahogany? Maple. Spider-Man or Iron Man? Spider-Man. Curly fries or regular fries? Regular fries. Fuzz or overdrive? Fuzz. Fuzz, fuzz, fuzz. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Please hide all of my shittiness. Fuzz all the way. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, this is a would you rather question. Would you rather all day long when you walk around smell onions or would you rather yourself smell like onions all the time? I'd rather I'd rather smell onions. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. I don't want to subject anybody to that. Let's, I'd rather I'd rather sub, I will take I will take the, the brunt. I will smell okay. the onions. <laughs> All right, uh, Baby Yoda or Gizmo? Oh come on, man, um, Gizmo because I was four. It's Gizmo. You okay. know, Gizmo's my guy. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Uh, diving board or water slide? Water slide. Huggies or Pampers? Uh, we're a Pampers family. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. I got a six month old. We're a Pampers family all the way. All right. And then the last one, this sometimes is the hardest for everybody. Sometimes okay. it's the easiest. 
Now, okay. this doesn't have to be the number one record, but if you could take one album and erase it from your memory, so you've cool. never heard it before, just to experience it again for the first time today, what album would that be? Oh, oh. my God. Holy, holy crap. That is like so sunshine of the spotless mind like it's so gone. that that i would have to say oh my god that's so hard right there's so many records i would have to say and i'm trying to think about all that stuff everything I'm trying to think of the record that like like stunned me the most i would it's have tough. to say oh my god I would have to say, uh, this might be, uh, you know, I'll pick it. It's Songs for the Deaf by Queens of the Stone Age. I was going to ask you if you were a Queens fan. A uh, hardcore Queens guy. Yeah. That record, that record, I think, I'm going to choose that one because I feel like there was, I was on a wayward sort of journey, like in that early 2000s where I liked the white stripes and the strokes and a little bit of that stuff, but it felt like with the avalanche of your your creeds and your nickelbacks that we were it was like what happened and then i heard queens of the stone age and i was like that's what happened and i was able to like dive into caius and all this this th that era of stuff and i was like that record felt like it was a lifeline that like there wasn't there wasn't going to be anything like that again it was over rock and roll for me was going to be i'll listen to some other stuff and it'll be fine but then i heard queens of the stone age and and i loved rated r I probably like Rated R better, but Queen Songs for the Deaf is a journey. That's a oh, yeah. that's an experience, and I remember how much I could not wait for that record to come out. And mm. yeah, I would say that's it. Songs okay. for the Deaf. Queens the first time I heard that, eh, 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 I was like, "What is this?" Like when it came on the radio. Oh, and then I, when I when I tried woo. to learn that riff for the first time, and I didn't know what like what tuning it was in, I was like, "What is it? So good!" <laughs> and I was like, "How how is he? How's that? How's he making that?" How's he doing that? And then yeah. I, like that whole dive, but that's that would be the record. That was a great question. Fantastic. That's, thanks, man. Yeah, that album awesome. is, is Hanging Tree on that record. It is. That's it a is. great tune too. And there's man. there's another good band that had like a bunch of people writing different songs. Like that's yep. part of why it's so good is you've got you know three different singers. You've got Dave Grohl playing drums, which is you know was at the time was like Dave Grohl's gonna play drums on the next record. And I was like, what? Oh, yeah. okay. What are we doing here? So right. that one, if I could hear that one again, if I could like, get in the car, you know, how the beginning of that record is the car tuning up in the radio station. If I could get in the car and drive and then Millionaire kicks in for well, the first time <laughs> yeah. where well, that song, like it does, the, you know, you hear the static and it kicks in and then it kicks in. I mean, I will, I will, I will drive through the sun. I would like, like explode off the road. And, yeah. and that, that record is just so like important to me that it was like, oh, we're going to be okay. Yeah. Rock and roll is going to be okay. No matter what, it might not be as big as it was before. It might not get to the levels of our Pearl Jams and Nirvana's, but it's going to be okay. Cause yeah. we've got, we've got bands like this still. It will, we'll all be okay. Yeah. Oh, that's such a great place to end, man. Well, thanks, Matthew. Thank you for doing this. Thanks man. for having me. I was looking forward to it for a long time. Yeah, man. So everybody, um, this Saturday morning, we have Scott McKeon is going to be on the show. Do you know that cat? No, Matthew. Scott. He's a UK blues guy, blues guitarist, amazing, Sweet. amazing player. He'll be on this Saturday morning. Um, but you can hang Matthew for a second. But everybody, take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And uh, we will see you next time.